Okay, we will reconvene this meeting of the Veterinary Medical Board and we will move on to 6B, um, the third item talking about the veterinary client patient relationship and telehealth. And we're yeah, okay. So telehealth, uh, really this language came out of the last Veterinary Medical Board meeting and the language as we voted on it in July referred to telemedicine, um, which was the term that was used um, to discuss uh, a mode of delivery that is something other than in person. Um, the actual terminology used in the medical field is telehealth. Tara made some uh, suggestion changes. If you look at 2032.1, and again, just for uh, the public record, uh, we decided to put the telehealth language within the veterinary client patient relationship. Um, so if you look at subdivision E and F, and there are a few changes made that were, are just more non-substantive kind of conforming changes in subdivision D. Uh, this really represents the board's motion at the last meeting with uh, a change to the term telehealth as opposed to telemedicine. Um, but there really wasn't anything substantive in terms of the context of this language changed. So this is just for the board to give us the authority to move forward with a regulatory proposal as amended. Okay, so um, after reviewing the Business and Professions Code section on telehealth, which applies to all practitioners licensed under Division Two, which includes veterinarians, um, we're thinking that perhaps we should go back to the use of telemedicine in subdivision F and then actually defining it, giving it a very small definition that um, provides a direction that this is not telehealth, which is broader. So what I'm proposing is on subdivision F of CCR section 2032.1, changing telehealth to read telemedicine shall be conducted within an existing VCPR, continuing that same, the rest of the sentence, but adding a new sentence which would read, for purposes of this section, comma, quote, telemedicine, end quote, shall mean the mode of delivering animal health care services via communication technologies to facilitate the diagnosis, comma, consultation, comma, treatment, comma, and care management of the patient. <laughs> so the difference is, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Just for, for the purposes of this section. Mm -hmm. Quote, telemedicine, end quote, shall mean the mode of delivering health care services via communication technologies to facilitate the diagnosis, comma, consultation, comma, treatment, comma, and care management of the patient, period. So the difference here is that telehealth under Business and Professions Code <coughs> includes diagnosis, consultation, treatment, education, care management, and self-management of a patient's health care. So it's, it's broader than what the committee was contemplating with uh, the provision for telemedicine. So effectively, it's, <coughs> it's just a, a smaller category. What did, you what, did you get that from someplace else? And um, should it be the act of, instead of the mode of yeah. delivering? So I'm using the definition of telehealth, but modifying it 
so that it's the smaller subset of authorized activities. Right. And um, in that definition. Yeah, in the definition for telehealth, it says means the mode of delivering healthcare services. But isn't it an act that we are are defining? No, I think we're defining that it's via phone or computer rather than in person. So it's it's the mode of providing the healthcare services. I mean, when you do that, like you're practicing veterinary medicine, mm -hmm. yeah, <coughs> then I, I think it's, it's an act if you're practicing veterinary medicine. Well, the, what the mode is, is referring back to is telemedicine being a type of delivery system. So it's not, the, it's not defining the service, it's defining the mode of delivery. I think that's how it's being defined, <coughs> right? You regulate the act. act itself. But the, so telemedicine is the mode of delivery. That's, that's how it's being delivered. But then the services is what you're referring to, the act. So these animal health care services are the act that we're yeah, right. under that mode. <clears throat> okay, any other discussion? I know it's going to take a while to digest this. You need to read again? Yeah. Okay. Could you read it again, please? Sure. <laughs> For purposes of this section, comma, quote, telemedicine, quote, shall mean the mode of delivering health care, animal health care services via communication technologies to facilitate the diagnosis, comma, consultation, comma, treatment, comma, and care management of the patient. Grant Miller, Regulatory Director, CBMA. Um, in relation to Section F, and Ms. Walsh and I had discussed this previously, but on the record, we want to make sure that the word veterinary is changed to veterinarian yeah. in client-patient relationship. Thank you. We need to do that in a couple of the different regulatory documents and for consistency. Can we just do that f from now till the end of time? Mm -hmm. yeah. Standing, standing request from the CBMA. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Kathy Bowler? Yes. Jennifer Laredo? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Okay. And the motion is, motion sorry, passes. Tara, let me read the motion yes. so we, oh, we yes. don't get ourselves in trouble. This motion is to approve as amended. The proposed <laughs> regulatory changes is uh, direct the executive officer to take all necessary steps to initiate the rulemaking process, authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive substantive changes to the rulemaking package, notice the proposed text for a 45-day comment period, and if no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, the proposed regulatory changes, um, adopt the proposed regulatory changes as modified. No, no. We're okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Moving on to 6B, the topic on animal physical rehabilitation. 
Okay, again, um, this reflects uh, the board's recommendation from the April meeting, uh, the language that's before you. It is pertinent to RVTs and those classified as veterinary assistants. I do want to point out that there is an additional document in the packet that was distributed at the last meeting. Um, the document was a little confusing in that uh, prior to the changes that I've made for this meeting, item eight appeared to be the recommendation out of the task force that was the, then adopted by the Veterinary Medical Board. When in fact, item eight came out of the task force, the Animal Physical Rehabilitation Task Force, and the board uh, amended the motion and the motion of the board is actually item 9 so this document serves to clarify what actually occurred in the process of the task force and then the board's motions um, again this is here for, for clarification uh, in terms of the language itself um, Tara did revise some of the language and her footnotes are included in the document to conform with the regulatory usage of performing tasks that referring to RVTs um, and then there was some rewording of the language under subdivision E uh, to make the language just more clear for the purposes of regulation. So I'm going to open it up for discussion. Discussion from the board? Comments? And here we actually have a veterinarian client patient relationship. Yes, we need a motion then. Yes, Dr. Sullivan. I move that uh, we uh, submit this regulation for processing. I'll second. Jennifer seconded. Any comments from the public? <coughs> Diane Isbell, equine veterinarian. I'm a regulatory veterinarian at the racetrack, and I have a private ambulatory practice off the track. I would suggest that under the veterinary assistant that in the large animal range setting, the veterinarian be allowed to determine the degree of supervision. And I say this for two reasons. One, horses are dangerous. I can't just bring anybody in off the street to work for me. Horses kick, a little known fact, with 900 pounds per square inch pressure. A just the circumference of the uh, shoe is at one and a half tons for one foot, and that is a deadly force. We equine vets pay ten times that of a small animal vet for our liability insurance, not because of the value of the animal, but because of the degree of human injury that's associated with them. And over the years, I've read in the uh, liability newsletter about uh, multiple. Uh, compound fractures, internal injuries such as ruptures, leans, and the occasional death uh, that occurs due to chest or head trauma from horses. So I have to find, be they an RVT or a veterinary assistant, I have to find somebody that already has a good set of horse handling skills. They're aware of the horse, they're aware of the environment around them, the things that can spook them. They're aware of the audience that shows up when the vet comes or anybody comes to work on the horse and they have the skills to control the situation. The other problem is finding an RVT with that level of skills for the equine world. I live in the Bay Area, we're a fairly populous area, there's lots of horses. You'd think I could find someone. I've looked for four years and I can only find two that are actually already hired and they don't want to commute through our traffic to where I would be working. It is not so difficult to find a veterinary assistant, uh, somebody who has worked with a group of horses, managed a group of horses, and can certainly, uh, they will already come with a subset of rehabilitation skills because horses are always entering themselves. So it is possible to find a veterinary assistant, not easy, but possible. I've robbed a couple from the racetrack to work for me part-time. Uh, so, Due to the dangerous nature of horses, the need to have somebody quite skilled in working with them, and the unfortunate dearth of RVTs who have that level of skill for horses, 
I suggest that the uh, veterinary system be changed in the only in the large animal range setting to the level of supervision to be determined by the veterinarian. So I believe as it reads, it's a large animal practice, the appropriate degree of supervision shall be determined by the veterinarian who established the veterinarian client patient relationship in a range setting. No, not in the actual no. language. But that's not in this language. Right. right, because you didn't vote to approve that. You voted to approve at the last meeting for veterinary assistance. So in the language itself, veterinary assistance may perform animal physical rehab under the direct supervision of a veterinarian. That motion was made in April, and it is covered. Um, actually, it was made in July, and, and it is covered in the document, the very last motion. So the motion before that refers to physical therapists, and the only way for that motion to be adopted by some form of regulatory construct is for there first to be a statute that recognizes physical therapists as someone who can practice veterinary medicine under the Practice Act. So we're not dealing with statute today. Today we're dealing with regulation. And so the regulation proposed in July is documented in this separate document, but it is also in the language before you today. Comments? I, I thought, I guess I feel like we made a mistake. I thought we were going to add uh, the large animal, for a large animal practice, the appropriate degree of supervision shall be determined by the veterinarian for veterinary assistance in a range setting. I, I guess I missed that. Yeah, well, the veterinarian still has, I mean, the, the, the reason we're having this wording here is that the veterinarian still can uh, make the decision whether that RVT is under direct or indirect supervision. They're talking about the veterinarian. I know, that's what I'm getting to. We, we don't have any authority over anybody else uh, other than somebody that's licensed. So the veterinarian assistant, whether they're off the street or have a PhD, they're still a veterinary assistant and according to this is under direct supervision. Uh, the only leeway we were giving on the other on the other motion in my understanding was for RVTs to be under either direct or indirect under the discretion of the veterinarian with the uh, with the VCPR in a range setting. So if a veterinarian um, delegates a job to a veterinary assistant in a range setting, for instance, cold water washing a limb, and something goes wrong, we, does that mean the veterinarian is, is uh, outside of the practice boundaries? We're only talking about animal physical rehab. Mm -hmm. That's all we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, Other if you tasks. go back to your definition of animal physical rehab, is the treatment of injury or illness to address pain and improve function. Cold water washing is exactly that. In the horse world, that's what, what but I don't think, think that still fits APR. But in a court of law, I think it might. I mean, <coughs> we have to be very careful in that. Washing you, horse is not. I'm not talking about washing, I'm talking about a bow tendon that needs cold water therapy or ice therapy immediately. And we direct a veterinary assistant to do it because we're out on a call on some other animal. And if something goes wrong and the client goes to court with that, they, they can make an argument for that, in my opinion. Um, well, I think the discussion is about whether or not, and correct me if I'm wrong, whether we should ex expand indirect supervision in the, the range setting mm -hmm. for the large animals. Is the veterinarian that has, that has directed a veterinary assistant to provide a treatment option in a range setting, is that veterinarian then liable for malpractice if something goes wrong in the end is in their suit? Yes. Well, I, I have a problem with it without adding the range setting because I think a lot of large animal veterinarians will, are in a daily, you know, daily practice going to have to break that rule if they're going to do that for work. They're, well, they're always liable for yeah, their employees. Yes, I know they're always liable, but I mean, are they going to be able to say that, that, that um, they knew by statute that they were not to direct a veterinary assistant to do that treatment? That's what I'm asking. Right. I mean, this actually 
pretty much mean, would maintain, I guess, in effect, existing law insofar yes. as if a veterinarian is directing an assistant to provide APR, it's, it's direct supervision. I mean, the whole request has been, the discussion has been focused on whether or not a physical therapist could provide physical therapy on animals outside of a veterinarian practice and this specifies that it's still within the context of veterinary medicine. Pro, uh, so the APR is provided by the veterinarian and then delegated to an RVT or a VA under either direct for only VAs or RVTs as determined by the veterinarian. I think the veterinarian should be able to determine either one of them, are you saying? I think there are instances to, to correctly care for an animal. There needs to be some ability to do VA treatments under indirect supervision. Yes, and I think part of this is the definition of APR, because I think you know, if a horse had a sustained laceration and you instructed your veterinary assistant to apply ice to the wound, yes, it's a treatment, but that's not animal physical rehabilitation. You're treating a laceration with the use of ice. Uh, okay, well where does that, I mean you're, the definition is so broad that it really it doesn't define that clearly in my mind. So I think that's a problem. So I see a problem that we have. We, 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 we did try to, we went down that avenue years ago of defining it very specifically and got into a lot of trouble with doing that. And the first job of the task force was to define it, define it, and it was under, uh, you know, advice of multiple people to keep it more open so that we weren't restricting people from exercising uh, animals for doing other types of activity that truly didn't fall under animal physical rehab. So it, it is meant to be open for interpretation and uh, um, I, you know, that's, that's the problem with writing regulations. And so you either, you either define it really, really narrow and are stuck with it or you make it more broad where there is room for interpretation and, and, and work. Could you, <coughs> Kathy, I don't know if this solves it. it probably doesn't, and I'm not even sure we could do it, but <coughs> if, you ch if you added in D, uh, veterinary assistants may per perform APR under the direct supervision of a veterinarian or in a range setting at the discretion of the treating veterinarian. Is that what you're talking about, Jeannie? Yeah, I guess that's what I'm talking about. Unless somehow you want to not define, you could define first aid versus APR. I don't know, because I think most of it is, is you know, treatment that is, needs to be done fairly acutely, right? It's something that is urgent. Yes, I, I guess. Jennifer. Um, I, I remember having this discussion Thank each you. time we did, Thank and you. I can definitely appreciate the danger of horses pose. I've had horses my entire life. I've sustained several injuries. But I remember in the discussion, we, we, I can't wrap my mind around cold water therapy being the practice of APR, and that's the definition. I think that's where there was some ambiguity in it. So, Nancy. There's a bigger problem than that, and uh, number one, range setting is not defined in the practice set yet, and perhaps, I, I think I've seen some proposals to include it, but it is not included, and unless you also are planning to do that, this doesn't matter. And number two, uh, 2036 uh, doesn't allow a veterinary assistant to work uh, in anywhere other than an animal hospital setting. So you need to uh, amend 2036 as well if you're going to allow and, and apparently veterinary assistants are working uh, outside of animal hospital settings uh, with large animal veterinarians all the time, but it's all illegal currently because uh, 2036B says that a, a, that a veterinary assistant in an animal hospital setting may perform auxiliary animal health care tasks. So that's something that needs to be addressed before you can possibly allow a veterinary assistant to do anything in a range setting.
36. It's not in 2036. I think what is being referred to here is uh, 2036.5. Um, and it does talk about permit holders and veterinary assistance in an animal hospital setting. It really comes down to defining what an animal hospital setting is. So, um, you know, there's been some proposals to change that. As far as the, the range setting um, situation itself, it is described as general vicinity, um, which is very vague, but it is in the Practice Act that a range setting is where the veterinarian is in the general vicinity of the treatment area. Um, so I did want to respond to that, and I believe that's, that's been applied as, you know, within 30 miles or 30 minutes in the past. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, um, I feel like we continue to repeat the same discussion meeting after meeting after meeting. We had this very discussion in July. And I respect why you're bringing it up, but it, it was discussed in July. The minutes are reflective of what the board's motion was. Um, I, I don't know at this point, I, I do want to bring up that this definition of animal physical rehabilitation was not crafted by the Veterinary Medical Board. This came out of the Animal Rehabilitation Task Force and this definition was worked on by public members, licensed veterinarians, RVTs, physical therapists, consumers, council, and I believed at that point in time that this was the uh, most complete definition that we could come up with without excluding things that were in fact problematic to allow an unlicensed individual to do absent some form of supervision. Um, you know, if there is middle ground to discuss veterinary assistance in working with under the direct supervision of a veterinarian or where the veterinarian is in the general vicinity of the location for a large animal, I mean, that's another discussion, but I think we continue to have the same, same discussion meeting after meeting, and at some point we just need to decide whether or not we're going to go forward with this and, and let the public comment on this regulatory provision and allow people to weigh in on this very issue. And is it going to be confusing to the public? You know, perhaps the definition isn't where it needs to be, but I think we're going to get that input as we go through the regulatory process. Is there a motion on the floor? Yeah, uh, you motioned and Jennifer Laredo seconded the motion. To adopt it. Any other comment? Any more comment from the public? Good afternoon. James Sims, uh, California Physical Therapy Association. Uh, kind of a point of clarification, first of all. I think it's uh, inaccurate to describe this uh, regulation, proposed regulation as be coming out of the task force. The, the task, did. let me finish. Uh -huh. And um, it appears that, um, you know, the um, cherry picking of the recommendations of the task force um, occurred at a meeting in, Oct in uh, Oakland where certain parts of it was accepted. I think the, this board owns now the responsibility in the language of what is here. Um, a couple times it's frustrating as consumer also that public comments received by this board sometimes appears not to have been heard very well just that the Sunset Review Board asked for this formulation of the task force when it became apparent to them that maybe some of the other interests stakeholders and to me that's my opinion the genesis of in my understanding the genesis of the Sunset process having that task force formulated and then again in Oakland having it followed to some degree and not to a lot degree and we're back to deja vu again as Dr. Grant said back in Oakland as we go from there and it's a challenge for this group here and so um, I just want to make sure that um, we recognize where this has come it's been a long time for a few of us that have try to look at this and find a resolution and um, we're kind of at, we're at where we're at now. So, thank you. Thank you. 
Any other comments from the public? So, we have a motion and a second. Call for the vote. Okay, Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Kathy Bowler. Yes. Jennifer Laredo. Yes. Dr. Nolan. No. Dr. Nunez. No. Motion still carries. Motion carries. Five to two. Tara, since we're missing two members. Yes, four to two. I'm sorry. Four to one, two. I'm going to read the motion again. In case we're in a position that we're moving this forward, Terrace checking the manual on a 4 to 2 vote with two members absent. The motion is to approve, and there are no amendments to the language presented today. The proposed regulatory changes direct the executive officer to take all necessary steps to initiate the rulemaking process, authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non substantive changes to the rulemaking package. Notice the proposed text for a 45-day public comment period, and if no adverse comments are received during the comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt the proposed regulatory changes as modified. All right, so according to the uh, board's administrative manual, when there are six or more members of the board present at a meeting, the concurrence of five members is necessary to constitute an accurate decision. So this does not carry. Correct. Okay. He gives me instructions as the owner, not as the RVT. Right, right. And in a, an equine hospital, there are interns around, veterinary interns. And assistants. And assist, that was my question, is yeah. where would we have a situation where assistants would be performing these tasks without any Well, changing wraps would be one thing. You know, um, what, cold water therapy, uh, putting a horse in a, um, a uh, salt water, um, pardon me, I'm having a brain freeze. Uh, in a uh, treadmill, uh, probably considered therapy. It's not. It's it's fairly exacting. You have to know what you're doing. But again, if you don't, if you can train your veterinary assistant to help you with that, I I think that it's realistic. So, would you consider putting a dog in a saltwater um, treadmill? Do you do that with dogs? <laughs> An underwater treadmill. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I consider that part of. But just changing a bandage, no. Okay. Doing ice packs, no. Okay. 
Again, it, it I think reflects back on the the function or the task. If if it is a a horse that is undergoing normal exercise therapy for its running procedures, I I I think that's much different than than the treatment for a medical condition. I think a lot of it is semantics and. Uh, and I do agree that the, the, uh, the purpose that we consider the range setting different is that the population is different. The health needs of, of the uh, small animal uh, patient is, is greatly geriatric, whereas in the equine business, it's, it's more athletic. I think the risks are different, but I don't know how to write that in regulation without Losing, uh, lo losing the teeth in it. Um, I, I, well, I don't know how to do it. <coughs> yes, Val. Valerie Fenstermaker, CVMA. Maybe the longest running person in this topic. <laughs> as long as I can remember, almost. But. Um, in the interest of moving this forward, I would suggest you look at the MSM language because it is an ex existing regulation and it reads, um, at the time a chiropractor is performing MSM on an animal patient in a range setting, and I realize there is not a definition of range setting, however it is in here and there are efforts to define it. Um, the supervising veterinarian shall be in the general vicinity of the treatment area. It's in regulation. If you're going to go down this road, I would suggest you at least look at what's already there. What, what subdivision were you looking at? 2038C. Um, 2038C. It's the second sentence. Which is, I think, what I suggested when Nancy yeah. brought it up, is that there is a model for that. Um, one of the challenges that we may face with that is, and we didn't face it at the time MSM was adopted, is, um, and this is something we'll just have to deal with if, if that becomes an issue, is the Office of Administrative Law may require us to define general vicinity. So, I mean, there, is, there are some hurdles because it is vague. But it's what I read earlier. So this is not an indirect supervision model. That, I think, is what Val was pointing out and what I think that bears discussion. It's direct supervision, in the in the, but they have to be in the general vicinity. So it doesn't change the supervision protocol. Yes. Okay. What it changes is the setting that you're in. So if there's a little more comfort in that, in that it's still required to be direct supervision, but if in a range setting, the veterinarian may provide that level of supervision in the general vicinity, that, that is an option. Go ahead and make the motion. I, I move that we approve the language, the proposed language, uh, with the exception of adding to 30, I'm sorry, 2038.5D, Veterinary assistants may perform APR under the direct supervision of a veterinarian. Uh -huh. um, or if in a range setting, the veterinary assistant is performing APR on an animal patient, excuse me, I, let me restart that. Yeah. Veterinary assistants may perform APR under the direct supervision of a veterinarian. Um, at the time the veterinary assistant is performing APR on an animal patient in a range setting, the supervisor, veter supervising veterinarian shall be in the general vicinity of the treatment area. Mm -hmm. I second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? I don't really object to that because that is the definition of direct supervision. What I still like to reiterate my point that veterinary assistants are not allowed to work in a range setting unless you write a new regulation, 
amend 2036B at the same time. But it can in direct supervision. Under any sub supervision, subject to the provisions of subsection A of the section, permit holders and veterinary assistants in an animal hospital setting may perform auxiliary animal health care tasks under the direct or indirect supervision of a licensed veterinarian or the direct supervision of an RVT. It doesn't say anything about any other setting other than an animal hospital setting. Well, I would refer you to 2034G, which says it defines animal hospital setting to mean all veterinary premises which yes. are required exactly. to be registered with the board, which could effectively be a mobile. Could be arranged. Okay, a mobile. Or a mobile practice. So, a mobile practice. So, yeah. if the, uh, so if the veterinarian is present, yes. then, yeah. then it's okay. Well, they have to have a premises permit in order to be an animal hospital setting. Okay, so they cannot work, they could not do it under indirect supervision. If the veterinarian was not present in the general vicinity, right. then there would not, the there would, yeah. then there would be no mobile, there would be no premise permit. The premise permit goes with the veterinarian. Right. But the, pre the veterinarian takes his mobile practice with him to the Yes, yeah, so as long as the veterinarian is there. Right, that's the idea. Yeah. I mean, that was what I thought we were doing. Yeah. That's I just have a comment. Um, the way I look at 2036 and these other new regulations is that you're adding, you're adding tasks that a VA can do. I don't have any problem with 2036 because to me it doesn't say that a VA can only do these tasks in an animal hospital setting. And I know that there's proposed new regulations that will clarify that, but in the meantime, I think from a legal perspective, this just adds something, and I think we need to always look at all the regulations in the Practice Act sort of taken as a whole. And again, there's nothing in 2036 that says that a VA can only perform animal health care tasks in an animal hospital setting. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. I think she had a comment. Oh, did somebody? I, I have Sorry. a question. Um, as an ambulatory vet, having come from a rural area uh, where I grew up, the question is how can we, in the uh, general vicinity, when you may have a 200 mile diameter practice area, how can we be in the general vicinity? Um, you know, somebody might be out preg checking cows and doesn't even have cell phone access. Uh, in a more rural environment, uh, you know, so I think, again, to go back for the veterinary assistant to be able to provide an in, uh, AR in a uh, range setting and direct or indirect, you know, puts the onus back on the veterinarian to be sure that person is qualified. You know, and then if it is a general vicinity, how do I know how far away I can be? I do need to caution, we don't write regulations for every situation. We write regulations as a general rule. And so it would not be appropriate for the board to tailor regulations to each and every situation. It may require more oversight than what you've done in the past, but I think this allows for flexibility for those individuals to be treating horses while you're not in line of sight or in a facility or you know, directly overseeing those services that are appropriately delegated to a veterinary <coughs> assistant. And you as a veterinarian decide the degree of competency of the individual that's providing those follow-up services for you. So again, I just, I just want to make that statement that it would not be responsible for the board to write regulations to tailor something to individual situations. It needs to be applied as a whole. And as I stated, through the public comment period mm -hmm. process, if we find that there is enough public comments from the large animal medicine world that this is not a workable solution, then the board's gonna have to revisit this. That's why there is a public comment period. I think where we struggle is that we're getting hung up on trying to write language that suits every comment that comes before the board, and that's not the way regulations are written. I respect you know the comments and I appreciate the input because I think it's something that we have to look at, that's our job, is to take into consideration, is this really a workable um,
provision that provi provides the type of consumer protection that we need for something we consider perhaps a, you know, has a degree of risk associated with it that we're calling it out separately than other tasks. And our job is to take in the public comment and to evaluate that. But I think we have to start somewhere or we're, we're not gonna get to the point where we're actually noticing this and taking in that input from the general public. Nancy. Just one more comment. I recall back when we were actually writing the definition of direct supervision, this came up about what does it mean in a large animal setting. And the discussion was that the general vicinity meant that the veterinarian was available should something come, uh, an emergency arise, so that they were not gonna be so far away that they couldn't come back and assist the, uh, who, the, veter the RVT or the assistant uh, if there was an emergency. That was, you know, that was the best that people could come up with. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Yes. I'm just uh, James Sims, California Physical Therapy Association. Um, if I can have the motion, this motion that is being considered. Read the motion read. reads as follows: Veterinary assistants may perform APR under the direct supervision of a veterinarian, period. If at the time a veterinary assistant is performing APR on an animal patient in a range setting, the, supervisor veter the supervising veterinarian shall be in the general vicinity of the treatment area. Okay. Um, a vote was taken, four to two, and five needed to carry the noticed regulation in the agenda. And now there is a vote on something that I'm wondering if it's in order because it wasn't agendized and it's that was it done. I mean, we have counsel here that will uh, notify the board. I just want to, yeah, because yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to wish any additional procedure. Yeah. 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 When I read what's agendized, it is add 2038.5 to the CCR regarding animal physical rehabilitation. The, there's language here that the, the board can vote on. And as long as they're talking about animal physical rehabilitation and adding section 2038.5 in whatever context and with whatever revisions come out of this discussion, as long as the board is voting on that, which they are, mm -hmm. That, that doesn't fall outside okay, of the, the agenda. Not have it kicked down the road. I, if Valerie's longest, I'm the second longest, then kicking this can <laughs> down the road. So I uh, just want to make sure we're good in that. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Um, Tara, can I ask a procedural question? The uh, motion was amended. A new motion was presented. It wasn't amended. Um, Dr. Nolan uh, made the motion. Dr. Sullivan seconded the motion. The motion included the language to um, approve this as amended. Do I need to read this entire text again? The 45 day. Yeah. Yes. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> you can all sing along. Since we probably all know the tune by this point. The motion is to approve as amended. The proposed regulatory changes direct the executive officer to take all necessary steps to initiate the rulemaking process, authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package, notice the proposed text for a 45-day public comment period, and if no adverse comments are received, which I doubt will happen, during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt the proposed regulatory changes <coughs> as modified. Okay. Should so I call it? Call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Kathy Bowler. Yes. Jennifer Laredo. Yes. Dr. Nolan. Yes. And Dr. Nunez. No. Okay. So now we have our five to two. Five to one. My math is great. Five to one. Carries. Carries. Motion carries.
Moving on to 6B, number 5, uh, regarding drug counseling. talk about drug counseling and um, this came out of the MDC this was a recommendation by the MDC before the veterinary medical board to consider this language um, many of you know the history uh, so I won't bore us to tears with explaining where this all came from but it was a legislative bill it was in SB 546 originally and there was quite a bit of negotiation by the uh, sponsor um, of the bill, uh, the committee, the California Veterinary Medical Association. Um, I was representing the medical board, the, not the medical board, the veterinary medical board during these uh, negotiations, if you will. And we've taken in quite a bit of public comment on this uh, regulatory provision. And so this has been, I think, um, pared down to something that would be very useful. Uh, I do believe that there's a couple of questions that uh, the board may have on some of the language to get clarification, but this has been a long road to come up with a proposal that essentially uh, requires veterinarians to provide, or at least offer to provide, um, whether it be an oral consultation or something through electronic means, but information about drugs being dispensed to their animals. And I will start. Um, I had a question on um, A, number one, the name and description of the dangerous drug. When you say description, do you mean the like type of drug? Is it an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory or what is the meaning of it? So, yeah, John, maybe Dr. Klingborg, yeah. maybe you can come. I'll make my way up there. Do you mean that, or do you mean it's a white pill or a brown pill? Yeah, it, the, the format, the, 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 the milligrams of the pill, is it a tablet, is it a pill? Those are description. Color uh, so of the pill. A 50 milligram pill. So yeah. Just, okay. Any other comments, questions? Question: When you don't go, where do you go? Uh, any special directions? What, what does that mean? Um, special directions for proper use and storage. That that might be: Don't take this drug with prednisone. Don't take these two drugs at the same time. Okay, that would be the common adverse effects. Right. Well, not necessarily. not necessarily. I mean, it could be take with plenty of water, give with food as a special direction. That's not an okay. adverse okay, effect. Thank you. Okay. Don't take with dairy, that's common. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I move that we accept this uh, language for a uh, regulation proposal. Second. Second. Any other questions from the board? Any questions from the public? I know you've worked hard on this, so I'm sorry, but I, 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 there's just some vague terms here that concern me as, as someone who is involved with um, enforcing it through my clients. Um, the first question I have is, B, 5B, because I did, I was questioning description, but you responded to that. 5B, where it says, if requested a veterinarian shall provide drug documentation, if available, what kind of documentation are you referring to? Dr. Sotla wants to handle this. This is if, um, if, if there's some extensive explanation needed and the person wants it in writing, we can go to uh, any online uh, service and provide that documentation. Uh, briefs, uh, what is that, uh, Plum Briefs has very good software on providing that for client information. So it means if, if they request some documentation, we need to provide it. So that could be just a page from Plum? Yes. Okay. 
And then I just would suggest that maybe, just to keep this in legal language, 5D, where it says it shall be noted in the medical record if a consultation is provided or refused, mm -hmm. I would say declined, because we use the term declined. Because usually they decline, they say no, they don't really refuse. Any other comments from the public? Dr. Sullivan? I just moved to, uh, or yeah, moved, to, uh, I guess, amend the motion to remove, refuse, and put in decline. Okay. Okay. And who's? I still second. Who's? Okay. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Well, I have to read this horrendous oh, thing. Yes. You won't hear. Mark's going to read it. <laughs> the motion is to approve, as amended, the proposed regulatory changes as modified, direct the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non substantive changes to the rulemaking package. Notify the proposed text for a 45-day comment period, and if no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt the proposed regulatory changes as modified. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Kathy Bullard. Yes. Dr. Laredo. Yes. Dr. Nolan. Yes. And Dr. Nunez. Yes. Thank you. Ocean Pass. And going to 6B, number 6, um, regarding emergency animal care. All right, so this again came out of the MDC. Um, and when the MDC requested that uh, council and I work together, and Tara did an exceptional job reordering this, um, part of the request from the MDC was to actually put this language in order of the types of emergency care services that an RVT could in fact render um, without the veterinarian on site and it could be done under protocol. And so the section itself has been reordered. So, you know, application of tourniquets and pressure bandages, resuscitative, resuscitative oxygen procedures, um, those, what we would consider life-threatening um, or life-saving treatments are itemized ahead of subset B, which essentially says that the RBT would have to have direct communication with the veterinarian um, in order to administer pharmacological agents to prevent or control shock or Granular fluids, I don't know what that is. Um, administration of drugs, oh, that's an IV, okay. Administration of drugs or, <laughs> drug or drugs to manage pain or to sedate an animal for an examination or to prevent further injury. So there is a provision here that says if direct communication cannot be established under subdivision B, that the RBT can perform the task under written instructions established by the supervising veterinarian. Um, or in the case of a sanctioned rodeo or other sporting event, the veterinarian charged with the responsibility to provide the treatment to the animals at the rodeo or event, meaning that they can have direct communication with maybe not their supervising veterinarian, but the veterinarian that's been sanctioned by that sporting event or the rodeo <coughs> to provide um, emergency to render emergency care as needed that veterinarian can in fact commission the RVT to provide drugs to sedate or to uh, administer other pharmacological agents to prevent shock um, so this again came out of sunset review part of it did um, in that we were asked to explore the option of changing regulations to allow RBTs to provide a certain level of emergency care at rodeos. Um, so that's what the impetus was for this language before the MDC. Um, in reviewing this language, we also discovered that this really does help 
certain situations in shelter settings where emergency care may need to be rendered in the absence of a veterinarian, but can be done safely and effectively under written protocols or through direct communication. Why is that last sentence there? It says such veterinarian shall be authorized to practice in the state. Yeah, what is, is that in reference to that the came rodeo? from uh, it came from subdivision or paragraph A2. Yeah. So if you look at the proposal, we're striking two, and at the very last sentence of that paragraph is such veterinarian yeah. shall be authorized. Initially, that referred to the employing veterinarian. So now it is the supervising veterinarian, or <coughs> in case of a sanctioned rodeo, so, so the this, veterinarian charged. So this, such this veterinarian. veterinarian is referring to the rodeo? Yes, so th that last sentence is qualifying the veterinarian charged with responsibility to provide treatment to animals at a rodeo or event. Such veterinarian shall be authorized to practice in the state. So this prevents essentially, uh, let's just say, either a rodeo or a dog show from having a veterinarian there who may be from out of state who's not licensed to practice in California. That veterinarian could not I, be charged with responsibility for I the RBT. I understand RBT. that. But the, way I re the way it sounds is that this is, this is some sort of authorization of reciprocity. Yeah, why don't it just say it's, licensed? It's saying that it, 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 it sounds, the way it's written sounds like we're granting that veterinarian yeah. a license to practice in California. I know what you're trying to say, oh, but yeah, the way it's, 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 it's written, it sounds like you're granting them a license, a provisional license. So we could simply change that last sentence that says, um, or in the case of a sanctioned rodeo or other sporting event, the licensed veterinarian charged with responsibility to provide treatment to the animals at the rodeo or event. Or the, the veterinarian shall be a licensed California veterinarian, something like that. Okay, so do you want me to change yeah, authorized to licensed? The veterinarian shall be licensed to practice in this state? That sounds good to me, but Dr. Solomon has a question or point. Um, is there not a situation yeah. where uh, we may have a disaster and uh, out of state veterinarians could come in that aren't licensed but are authorized. That's separate. That's separate. Yeah. Why this is that separate? This is an This isn't a disaster. This is this no, is okay. much to what we yeah. don't have veterinarians in a disaster this situation is a where can do. they're yeah. authorized to practice and a, uh, a technician working under there. Is it all? Um, I thought we were trying to make this more broad so that it, uh, technicians could operate under the direction even outside a, uh, a rodeo. Yeah, they can. It, it doesn't, only the last part of it qualifies okay. the rodeo where, okay. where it talks about a supervising veterinarian versus a veterinarian employed by an event to provide oversight or care. So that last sentence qualifies that veterinarian as being someone that has to be essentially licensed in the state. I think we had authorized to practice because we were trying to figure out whether there would be any exempt settings, but there's really not any exempt settings. John? Well, we didn't license Olympics. I think we're gonna take care of that in statute. I'm not sure that you need that last sentence because in in the previous page we talk about the following tasks shall only be performed after direct communication with a veterinary license or authorized otherwise authorized to practice in the state. Mm -hmm. And I think we could potentially consider striking that final sentence because the veteran is already authorized. Yeah. And okay. that is there because of disaster situations.
And, I'm sorry, was there a second? Second. Okay. Oh. Oh. Any comments from the public? That's fine. Okay, now I get oh, the yeah. one. I, I just have one question on um, section C, the, the last page. Who is that supervising veterinarian? That, that just confuses me as far as supervising, because you're talking about how they can um, perform tasks after direct communication with a veterinarian licensed or otherwise authorized to practice in the state. Right, but and if they can't, if they can't directly contact the supervising veterinarian, they can work under the supervisor veterinarian's protocols. RBTs can work under a supervising veterinarian's protocols. Really, at any given time, they're doing something that requires only indirect supervision. But the, the difference is, is there's a veterinarian that may be employed by a rodeo or a sporting event that may not be that RBT's supervising veterinarian. This gives the flexibility that that veterinarian that's charged with oversight for that event could also be the one to establish those written protocols. Okay, and I, I understand that part because that's the second part, but I still don't understand where these protocols, I mean, this is an emergency, so I don't understand who wrote these protocols and how the RBT acting in that emergency circumstance happened to have, just happens to have protocols. I mean, where so do for those a protocols come So for from? a rodeo event where the veterinarian may be on call because that's more of a typical standard, the RVT would be on site and be, would be working under protocols. No, and I understand that. I mean, I used to show dogs, so, so I get it. I'm, I'm talking about the before the or, because it says or in the case of a sanctioned rodeo or other sporting events. I'm talking about the part before the or, which says that in the event that direct communication cannot be established as required under subdivision B, the RVT may perform the task in accordance with written instructions established by the supervising veterinarian or in the case of a sanctioned rodeo or other sports. Shelter medicine. Shelter medicine. They're operating under protocols all the time. Oh. But they don't have the authority to sedate an animal. No, and I understand that. I guess what I'm getting at is the or says that this is a different circumstance. So the or means if you're talking about a rodeo or a dog show, what is the situation before that when there's an emergency and you have written protocols? The shelter medicine. No, I think no. what she's trying to say is, I mean, I, I can't, you're, an RVT is working for somebody. Right. And so, I mean, I think what you're saying is if the RVT is just walking down the street and not employed by anybody and comes across an emergency situation, you're asking which written protocol they follow it. Is that what you're asking? Pretty much. I mean, in other words, you're allowing the RBT to perform these tasks either after they've had direct communication with a vet or based on protocols set up by their supervising veterinarian. But how many supervising veterinarians have set up random protocols? Because, it, I mean, it's st the section does start out emergency animal care rendered by a registered veterinary technician. And then it says A, B, C, and C is, so if you say C, emergency animal care rendered by registered veterinary technicians, C, in the event that direct communication cannot be established. I don't, I don't see the issue. This is all under statute. In 4840.5, it provides for the authority of an RVT to administer emergency medicine. And it says, may render such life-saving saving aid and treatment as may be prescribed under regulations adopted by the board pursuant to 4836. Such emergency aid and treatment, if rendered to an animal patient not in the presence of a licensed veterinarian, may only be continued under the direction of a licensed veterinarian. Emergency, in quote, for the purposes of the section, means that the animal has been placed in a life-threatening condition where immediate treatment is necessary. The current language says to sustain life, but there's a bill that is believe been signed by this point um, where that to sustain life was removed. So it basically ends with condition where immediate treatment is necessary. This serves to qualify what's in statute. And, so and I understand that. I mean, I understand the purpose I, of it. I still I, think that from a point of view, from my point of having to explain it to somebody or to defend it, I'm very confused because it says that the RVT has to have direct communication 
and then skip the next part because that's the one that confuses me. Or if they're at a horse show or a dog show or a rodeo or whatever. Um, so those are those two. So there's three circumstances, direct communication, written protocols from a supervising vet, which I don't know kind of where that comes from and who that supervising vet is. Like what if this person happens to be just walking down the street or involved with a situation where there's a car accident or something? Well, I'm not so even talking I, about drugs. I mean, I'm talking about what well, they this do is, here. Is, but this is the administration of drugs. So, so I, just, I, I think I'd also like to just point out There's wound dressings and other things in here. It's not just drugs. No, it starts but, with subdivision B. The following task shall only be performed after direct communication with a veterinarian licensed or otherwise authorized to practice in the state. B goes on to talk about one and two. Okay. And then okay. C says that if you cannot establish direct, written protocols are already in the Practice Act in other areas. So I guess I'm struggling with what's confusing about this when there is a, a precedent for that in the Practice Act for shelter situations, which we talked about at length yesterday. Yeah, I'm not arguing the written protocols. I'm arguing, like, where do these come? Are these something that exist? Like that's my problem, is putting my arms around. Are these things that exist where the, the RBT knows how to put their hands on them? You know, are they something that exists from this supervising veterinarian in the sky that are there? Yes, they would exist because this language is actually existing law. We're just moving it from where it currently sits. So today, if an RBT needs to act without direct communication, they can proceed under written orders. That's only in the shelter situation. No. That's in 2069 right now without this proposal. All this proposal does actually. Oh, oh, I understand that. I, I still think it's confusing from, from my trying to decide where those protocols come from and who the supervising vet is. Is that the, the person who employs the? RBT? Well, that's interesting you say that because we're actually deleting the employing veterinarian and inserting supervising because that's the consistent use of the supervisor. It's, it's sorry, the veterinarian. It's the supervising veterinarian, which could be anyone at the practice. It doesn't have to be a licensing okay. manager, it just has to be the supervising veterinarian over the RDTs, whoever's keeping an eye on the care being provided. But this is all indirect supervision, so this is a supervising veterinarian who's not there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who somehow wrote these protocols and then the RDT follows the protocols. Okay, I still think it's confusing, but. Dr. Sullivan. I think, uh, Maybe an example would be, and maybe I'm confusing things, but uh, you could have a hospital policy, private clinic policy of protocol that when I'm gone between 12.30 and 1.30 for lunch, an emergency comes in and my RPT is there, she knows what to do with this emergency situation because there's a written protocol. I'm the supervising veterinarian, I've written this protocol, in an emergency she can follow these procedures. Any other comments from the public? Jamie wants comments from the board. Jamie's going to read this time. Yes. Okay. Jamie is reading. The motion is to is to approve as amended. The motion is to approve as amended the proposed regulatory changes. Direct the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process. Authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive substantive, sorry, changes to the rulemaking package. Notice the proposed text for a 45-day comment period, and if no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt the proposed regulatory changes as modified. <laughs> Okay. okay, Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Kathy Bowler. Yes. Jennifer Laredo. Yes. Dr. Nolan. Yes. And Dr. Nunez. Yes. 
Okay, moving on to agenda item number seven. <laughs> Cannabis and Tara is going to. Oh, okay. Sorry. As soon as long, we're going to have a bathroom break. Let's come back at three o'clock. Oh, okay. What are we on now? So uh, in tab seven is my memo on this issue, which uh, provides more detail uh, with respect to the uh, explicit federal and state laws that come into play here. Um, so I'm just going to provide a, an overview of the situation, which really is under both federal and state law. A veterinarian does not have any authority to administer, prescribe, dispense, or even recommend the use of cannabis to treat an animal, um, which differs from physicians insofar as they have at least the ability to recommend the treatment, which means having a discussion with the client or the patient to say, oh, you've got epilepsy, you might want to try uh, cannabis for that issue. That's the recommendation. The patient then goes to a dispensary separate and apart from the physician. There is no prescription. Um, and they, they then use the cannabis uh, upon, based upon the recommendation. Um, in, in the veterinarian context, there's no authority to do that. So what my memo proposes um, is seeking a legislative fix if they're so inclined to first request a study from the University of California, which would be identical to that study performed for the use of cannabis on human patients. And if that study concluded that the use of cannabis is helpful to animals, then at that point, the board would want to consider recommending to the legislature seeking the authorization to recommend cannabis to their patients. So a recommendation arguably falls outside of the DEA registration because there's no prescription or dispensing of a Schedule I controlled substance. And the recommendation itself, uh, not only could it be authorized by California through the legislature, but then the recommendation conversation could be First Amendment protection of um, free speech with the client which physicians currently enjoy, veterinarians do not. So um, if you have any questions, I can answer that. Otherwise, I'll just leave it up to the board to discuss. Yes, Anne-Marie would like to make a comment. Just one comment. Um, since this document, and I want to thank Tara for putting in a lot of time and energy to create this uh, legal memorandum, um, now that we've discussed this at a public meeting, this essentially waives any attorney-client privilege that we have, we may have uh, uh, been, we could have um, exercised attorney-client privilege with this document, but by means of discussing it in an open meeting, it becomes a, a public document and thereby we don't enjoy the privilege of keeping it uh, confidential. And I think it's important that the public is aware of the current status of the both federal and state laws uh, as it pertains to cannabis treatment for animal patients. I do want to call out one 
distinction here, and that is um, at the recent Board of Governors meeting uh, for the California Veterinary Medical Association, uh, they too had a legal opinion or a legal document uh, before their Board of Governors. And I think that these the two documents are very much coincide in a lot of ways. However, in the Board of Governors document, um, the recommendation did, uh, or an option, um, was documented that would essentially allow for legislation to provide some protection for the veterinarian to dispense marijuana, and that is very tricky. We are not looking at some sort of um, legislation that would allow a veterinarian to dispense because that is still a violation of federal law, and you hold a DEA license. This isn't about dispensing marijuana. This is about being able to have a conversation with your client, some discourse about the treatment um, that may be provided. So I want to make that distinction clear. We would not, as a regulatory agency, be requesting um, some form of protection for recommending, dispensing, or you know, doing anything with a Schedule One drug other than having a conversation with our client about the you know alternative uses of marijuana and perhaps what they need to be aware of if they're choosing to use these alternative uh, treatments on their on their pay, on the pets. Um, and I think that's a distinction that needs to be made. Dr. Sullivan. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that the law that was passed is for legal, legalization of marijuana in people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mention anything about pets, so there's another huge hurdle that has to be overcome down this road. Dr. Nunez. I, I, I found it a little bit interesting um, well, one of the possible board recommendations is um, um, the board may wish to recommend to the legislature that cannabis treatment on animals be studied in a manner similar to another study that was done for humans and performed by the University of California. So I, I didn't realize the University of California had to serve the pleasure of the legislature. If the legislature wants something studied, the University of California has to study it. Is that true? Yeah, we, at the it risk is, of putting you on the spot, would you want to come up and? Well, I said it is a constitutional or autonomous entity. Yeah. It is. Do you yeah, see the it? Budget. So I think the legislature is still correct. Yeah. Yes. But they don't. If the legislature asks you to study it, you don't have to study it. <laughs> yeah. I know you don't want to piss them off. <laughs> I, anyways, I thought that was interesting. Yes. Because it, I, I said, can we do that? Um, I think the legislature has directed mm -hmm. San Diego State University to do some studying on the effects um, to essentially devise a formula for what when someone is under the influence of and how that would be essentially identified separate and apart from alcohol or you're using a BAC. So I believe it's San Diego State University that's doing the study now on impairment and what you know medicinal impairment looks like or, or how you're impaired when you're smoking marijuana versus impaired drinking alcohol. And there are different markers and there are different ways to identify that. So that study, study was, um, I don't know want to say, you want to call it commissioned by the legislature, but was assigned to San Diego State. And yeah. I think there's another study at UC San Diego. I mean, in my opinion, is that actually is the only thing that I currently would support. Um, I, I don't know if I would even support the ability for a veterinarian to advise because they have no studies to base their recommendations off of, other than clinical experience, I suppose. And maybe I'd be able to be fashion and Jeff Session-ish about that, but <laughs> that's, that's how I believe it. So at this point in time, are we even allowed to tell our clients that there's discuss with our clients the topic to the point where um, you know, 
there is really no studies to confirm efficacy or dose or side effects or? Well, I think in having the conversation with your, your client, you're saying, one, I can't recommend anything. Mm -hmm. Two, there's, there's no research that I could rely on anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so really, the extent of the veterinarian discussion should be more about treating toxicity from yes. cannabis exposure because of the proliferation of these products now that there's not only the medicinal use of it, but uh, now we're also coming up to the recreational use. Um, so, you know, the, there's a great fear um, that more and more animals are going to be exposed to these items. Uh, and how, how does the veterinarian treat the patient when there's a cannabis toxicity? That, of course, would fall under your... your We've all existing, absolutely, yes. your existing um, authorization to treat the patient. Um, but when you're talking about using a medication to treat an illness with a drug that's a Schedule One, and in this case, cannabis, I would highly recommend the veterinarian stop the conversation you know and with just I can't recommend and we don't know today the best use of cannabis on animals so to clarify the state commissioned a study of medical marijuana on the use of human patients through the University of California. So it's, I guess you could just say it's a commission study rather than a directive to study. So what Anne-Marie and I talked about was possibly a motion to propose legislation to allow research in California and possibly um, give some level of protection so veterinarians can at least discuss marijuana with their clients. So that's the question is, what do we do? Uh, on the, the allow research, I think we have to be more determinative on who, who and what is the research and does it. Because there's probably plenty of people that claim they have research. So through the University of California? Yeah, I mean, so that, I think maybe that's, maybe that's why the stipulation was in the, for the humans. I, I, I would be I would <coughs> support would be willing to make a motion that we uh, recommend to the legislature um, that cannabis treatment be studied in a manner similar to the study on humans performed by the University of California. But do we know what the study is in humans? I don't know if I want to restrict it that way. Allow for research on the efficacy of the use of marijuana in animal patients. Dose, side effects. Side effects, yeah. Yeah. Well, would efficacy include those things if we just said a motion to allow research on the efficacy um, for using marijuana in animal patients through the University of California? I mean, that the language is going to be it's going to be rewritten by the legislature. So wordsmithing, it's not going to do us any good. But if the intent of the motion is to allow for research to study the use of marijuana in animal patients or the use of cannabis in animal patients to determine its efficacy, its safety, its yes. indications. Indications of use. Yeah. So um, when I read in, uh, in the memo under possible board recommendations uh, with respect to research, I note that uh, the board could request the study be performed by the UC through the Can California Cannabis Research Program, and I provide the Health and Safety Code section that commissions the study for humans. And in that, it says it's the intent of the legislature that the state commission objective scientific research by the premier you'll, you'll like this the premier research institute of the world, oh, the wow. University of California. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but I'm reading this for this purpose uh, <laughs> regarding the efficacy and safety of administering cannabis as part of medical treatment. I mean, it doesn't actually limit it to humans right there, but I think they have limited it to humans. Um, and it goes on to say um, the regions of the Cal that you see by appropriate resolution, if they accept the responsibility, the UC shall create a program to be known as the California Cannabis Research Program. So there is this legislative intent language already in the law. Uh, effectively, the recommendation would be to piggyback onto this, this statute to perform um, research on the efficacy and safety of administering cannabis as part of medical treatment on animals. And if we got, if we became part of that program, does it limit the type of studies that can be done? Well, in other words, maybe they're just studying well, cancer treatment or cancer side effects um, or something that doesn't necessarily affect. So let me continue. Um, the program shall develop and conduct studies intended to ascertain the general medical safety and efficacy of cannabis and, if found valuable, shall develop medical guidelines for the appropriate administration and use of cannabis. The studies may include studies to ascertain the effect of cannabis on motor skills. Um, Humans. This, this intent language is really long, and I think, you know, when I look at this overall, I see that their intent was to look at everything of the human condition uh, when treated with cannabis. Was that done uh, after 215 was passed? Way back when, or did it, when did the, <coughs> when did the research commence? That was 96, 96 or 98, something like that. But nothing was done for a long time. I believe you're correct. 215. It's related to 215. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. Dr. Sullivan? Yeah, I think we're way ahead by approaching that for a couple of reasons. I think I think we need some basic research to identify what even the toxic levels are for different species. I, I think in human medicine or beyond that to look at treatment, I don't think we're close to that. So I think we would have a difficult time talking about treatment when we don't even know what the toxic levels are. And I think there needs to be some basic science done uh, initially. And, and to me, that would be easier to sell because we're talking about treating toxic conditions than it is talking about research and using it when, when you know, we're in human, in veterinary medicine, we're a lot further away than human medicine is. In. But once they developed um, the ideas, once they developed sort of a toxic level, then the next step would be to yeah. Go check for efficacy for various problems. Yes, Kathy. It, <coughs> am I correct because of the federal problems here that there have been no studies from any of the universities anywhere other than it looks like Colorado did? There's very few facilities that can do research on Schedule One drugs. Right. Very few. And okay. Okay, so is there a motion? I, I motion, like I said, to, to recommend to legislature that um, studies be done on the uh, indications and efficacy of medical marijuana use in animals, and that um, and that that. Study be done by the, uh, the, the, the world premier, world premier, premier, premier research fabulous research organization, also known as the University of California. Specifically, the Dr. Weston can do this. No, no. <laughs> I was going to say, you can be more specific and say that the legislature shall commission the University of California Davis to conduct research through. 
process already through this California Cannabis Research Program and through the UC, it would be to encourage the legislature to broaden the intent of it to include animals, but not for the purpose of just research on animals, but for a medical reason. Does that make sense? So it may be a, a much cleaner, easier way to get an amendment to that. No, didn't make any sense to me. So, so as I understood what Tara has here, there's, there already exists um, this California Cannabis Research Program. Yes, and then, we don't know if it's exactly would fit veterinary medicine. Well, reading what I was just reading quickly, I don't think it does. It's restricted to human patients. But what I'm saying is that rather than recreate something, because there's a substantial amount of money that went to this, would be to carve out a piece of that for research in animals. So basically broaden it from humans to animals. Humans and animals. Just just an alternative approach. Do you know what the status of this is? Is it I don't know the um, current it looked to me like the quick look I looked on my phone that it doesn't, the appropriations didn't happen and it won't go into effect till 18. Hey. 18 or 19. So, you know, there's authorization, then there has to be appropriation, and it looked like there was another bill working its way through the legislature for appropriation. Well, so effectively, what, what you could recommend is amendments to health and safety code section 11362.9 uh, and which is which is the intent language commissioning the study um, as well as any other relevant statutes within that Article. Uh, it's uh, Article Two on cannabis. Okay. That's the motion I seconded. It is. <laughs> you guys work this. Out. Okay. So what I hear is that um, the motion would be to uh, amend Health and Safety Code Eleven Three Sixty Two Point Nine um, to include research on the efficacy, safety, indications of use in animal patients under this California Cannabis Research Program through the University of California at Davis. And <laughs> See, that's true. <laughs> yes, but, but, but we don't really know what that, what, where. Well, yeah, it's pretty hard to, I mean, we don't even have that in front of us. So, so here's something, here's another option. We meet again in February. We can actually provide you with these provision and do some research on how far along this California that's, Cannabis that's, Research Program is, what the actual language is or the direction for the research, and then we can talk about it. That's too bad. They want us to bring back information on Health and Safety Code of 11362.9 and also find out a little bit more about this research program in February. And there would, yeah, and I, I agree, and it would be, there would be very many different protocols for multi-species uh, research versus human research, so 
And who I don't know how they didn't face it. Well, perhaps we could get someone from we need to have the program itself to come in and give us a presentation on what they're doing today, where they're at in the yeah. research. Because um, otherwise, you know, it's it's us trying to make phone calls and get you know additional information, which we're interpreting. It's right. probably best just to hear it from the program itself. <laughs> Is this a state-funded program, then? Yes. We need a motion for that? No. Okay, we don't need a motion for that. I guess we're going to do more research on this. Can I read that statement anyway? I'd like to know that. The people that control this program, if they'd even be willing to give up some of their funding to Right, the that's the thing. So they may say, oh, no, no, no. Right. Yeah. We do our own thing. Yeah. Um, Is there anything else you think we need to do other than invite someone to? No, I, I think it's, you know, I mean, I've got the recommendations here in case you guys wanted to do something right now because, you know, I think there is some level of urgency with respect to the toxicity issues yeah. you're all seeing. Um, but as far as treating patients, um, I think that necessarily requires a deliberative process and bringing in someone from the current research program is, is a good way to um, help get the information you need to take the next steps. Okay, we done with marijuana. Um, moving on to agenda item number eight. Okay. Yes. I don't know if you guys don't want to use the parliamentarian, just that I think from the dispense, I think it was a motion and a second. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there was. You just dispense with that. You're right. Perhaps it's easy if the motion speaks in a second, which we'll would draw the face of yes. the new staff directed. Yep. Withdraw your motion. You don't have to. I, I could I could demand for there to be a vote, but I will I will withdraw it. <laughs> I would draw the second. Who's the second? It is Dick. Okay, agenda item number eight. Uh, Dr. Klingborg with the MDC report. Good afternoon, John Klingborg, MDC chair. You should have my report in front of you. It's got animals on it. Very cute. Thank you. It does start with number four because this it was the fourth item on the agenda. It was the first action item. So there's consistency there. The first three items were called order, committee remarks, and review of minutes. So we started with four. Uh, this was the thinnest packet I think I've had in my career at the MDC and uh, maybe the most difficult to make our way through. So uh, it was deceiving. <laughs> What you have in front of you in my report is a summary and kind of the main action items. I'll fill in a couple of blanks here. Our first uh, action item discussion, consideration of extended duty for registered veterinary technician regulations. We had a subcommittee that looked at uh, some language that had been proposed to us uh, through CARVTA and there were a couple of elements to that. And I identified them uh, as uh, one recommendation that the subcommittee, that the VMB restrict to RVTs and DVMs any procedure that involves a needle penetrating a body cavity or blood vessel that would potentially limit access to veterinary care. Uh, and so that, that was one recommendation. The second was a statement by our subcommittee that a needle penetrating an epidural space is an invasive and arguably a surgical procedure with a great potential that potentially should be restricted to DVMs only. The third was that the induction of anesthesia uh, by any means uh, should be done by an RVT, just by any means. Fourth was casting and splinting uh, to be performed by an RVT under indirect supervision. And then fifth was uh, again, a query, a discussion point by the subcommittee. Should uh, animal health care tasks be modified to state the veterinary assistant should be prohibited performing invasive procedures and how would we define invasive? 
So that was the that was kind of a launching off point. What we did in all of that then, our, our actu actual action items were in front of you. We did uh, propose to amend 2036 animal health care tasks for RVTs, and you will see that we have added the word general for B1, so it would read induced general anesthesia. And secondly, we removed apply casts and splints from a task that would need to be performed only under the direct supervision and moved it down under C where it may be performed under indirect supervision uh, by an RVT. So those were the two action items that came out of the five that, that I was speaking of. Next to the elephant there, just to orient you, we continued our discussion on epidurals and should they be restricted to DVMs only and or RVTs and melded into that a discussion of local anesthesia, topical anesthesia, nerve blocks, et cetera. And then also a discussion is when is invasive invasive and what does invasive mean is invasive in the eye of the beholder. And what we decided we should do is take those other conversations, uh, the penetrating of the body cavity, epidural, invasiveness, and really, instead of looking at it as a job tasks issue, look at it as a d duties of a supervising veterinarian. And maybe what we need to do is spend a little bit of time as we look at language in 2035.5, talk about risk, competency, training, invasiveness, what's happening in other states, what's the current standard of care for that particular job task, and try and see if we can't actually expand or clarify 2035.5 uh, to help provide some guidance rather than getting into this laundry list as we keep referring to it of very specific <coughs> tasks, some of which uh, may become more mainstream and others which uh, are, are well, there's new ones all the time so that was where we left that particular section of our agenda keep moving keep on swimming <laughs> questions so far okay keep going all right Agenda item number five, discussion and consideration of recommendations from uh, SHAC and the CVMA regarding public and private shelters and minimum standards and protocols for shelter medicine. We had a subcommittee that went to work on this particular item. Um, Dave Johnson and Jeff Pollard uh, did great work, put together lots of information, really uh, took uh, information that had been provided to us by SHAC and CACTA and other stakeholders uh, over a year ago now, or about a year ago, and uh, provided us with a list of, of eight specific uh, areas where we needed to look at changing regulations or clarifying um, various aspects of minimum standards and protocols for shelter medicine. So we had eight. Um, there, were the, there was addition of at least one or two more in the process of the conversation. And of the eight, we discussed about 1.75. <laughs> so- um, Could you be more precise? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even finish the second of eight. Uh, but they were very thorough discussions. And what we've done at this point actually is suggested that Shaq and Cacta, who did have a few other issues that bubbled up, take this back on at this point. They are the experts in this, working with our subcommittee, and then it's up to them in terms of what stakeholder groups they want to invite to their meeting, and then come back to us, hopefully in February, with some additional information so that we can move through this. John, can I ask a question? Yes. For clarification. The subcommittee, uh, is it still the same subcommittee at this point? So I haven't changed the sub okay. subcommittee yet, but I always, after a meeting like this, I always send a summary to the MDC about what we discussed, what our action items are, what new priorities the VMB has blessed us with. And at that point, I start to query uh, for who wants to be involved on what subcommittee. Um, and so I don't know if we're going to reshuffle the deck or not. I will, I will chat with them. Okay. 
okay? Um, and so that's, those are open uh, discussions in a way. They're one-on-one -on -one between me and the various committee members, uh, but that is a decision we'll make down the line. Soonly, though. Agenda item number six was a discussion and consideration of proposed statutory language regarding the veterinary student exemption. What you have in front of you in small print is language that we had previously discussed at the MDC and had passed through the MDC, had been discussed and passed by the board and was taken to the legislature where it hit a bit of a wall. And the real issue was in paragraph B where there were some concerns uh, that that language was going to create various problems for the universities. And so what we did yesterday was try and create some new language here that would satisfy, I think, a couple of the things that we really wanted to take out of B. And that they were essentially that we want to have some transparency when a student is uh, in, in part of their formal curriculum but is not in a campus setting. So they're in a veterinary clinic that's an approved uh, program of some sort. Uh, we want to have a written agreement of some sort of what that is going to look like uh, between the uh, the clinical. We want a, the clinical training site to be approved. <clears throat> Let me not say written agreement. But the clinical training site has been approved. The student has prior training in those activities, and the supervising veterinarian must be California licensed. And we felt that in making that addition, what that does is uh, protect all of the classes of consumer, and that includes not just the patient and the, and the client, but it, it protects the supervising veterinarian knowing what they should have, uh, and also protects the student who's another class of consumer. And so 5A is now offered to you as a new language that we think meets the goals without being overly burdensome to the universities or raising red flags. Okay. And then item number seven, discussion and consideration of the California Veterinary Medical Association's proposal regarding minimum standards for alternate veterinary premises practices. Uh, CVMA had seven long meetings and two years of them to hand us a substantially large packet, about as thick as our whole packet yesterday, um, with great regulations, but it was too much for us to absorb as a group. And what we're going to do, what we have done, is hand it off to a subcommittee who is going to sit there and look at it because it's a jigsaw puzzle that's been rearranged. So I don't think there's a whole bunch that's new. There are some new things. But there's pieces that are, have been rearranged and just understanding where they are and how they all fit together. And then have uh, the subcommittee walk us through it so we're not engaged in trying to write by group, but we can get some direction uh, from them. And so that is what we accomplished yesterday. Any questions from the board? Comments? Kathy? I just I forget. What is an alternate veterinary premises? So when we've got um, the small animal vaccine, our oh, animal vaccine right. premise, you know, your ambulatory, small and large animal ambulatory yeah. premise, premises, um, things of that sort. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we are pleased to hear that the MDC feels blessed by our directives. We do, <laughs> yes. We serve at your pleasure, as you often remind us, Mark. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Uh, just to close on that, so the MDC, uh, the priorities that still remain are the uh, alternate premises types that will come back in February as well as the shelter medicine issue. And because those are both extremely thorough and complex discussions, um, I think Dr. Klingborg and I felt that we would definitely be able to fill a day with those two items at this point, unless something comes out of the board um, the rest of the remainder of this afternoon and tomorrow, those are the two MDC priorities that will move forward in February. Um, so 
see a motion to accept, accept the report. Yeah. So moved. Second. Second. Any comments from the public? Call for the vote. Okay. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Jennifer Laredo? Yes. Kathy Bowler? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. It gets agendized for a future meeting. I don't think they're completely done with 2036 yet. They're still discussing um, what to do with the invasive procedures part. Uh, agenda item number nine, update on the implementation of Senate Bill SB 27, um, which is the Antimicrobial Use Stewardship Outreach Committee. Uh, I know Dr. Nolan has worked on this, and, and Anne Marie is going to start off the discussion of this. So um, in your packet, you have the letter that the Veterinary Medical Board, and it was actually the executive committee, which was um, the president and vice president, uh, wrote a letter um, in order to timely communicate with the California Department of Food and Ag about regulations they were uh, proposing um, on who can sell or yeah, dispense, essentially, um, an antimicrobial, an important antimicrobial drug. And of course, we have some issues that are outlined in the letter, primarily that it was a lay person who would actually be um, selling this drug. Um, and for obvious reasons, uh, the board has some strong opposition to that um, for safety reasons. Um, there was a, a parallel made to or comment made that, you know, the current practice before SB 27 was for these drugs to be sold from uh, feed stores and uh, other businesses that weren't pharmacies. And the whole point to SB 27 was to move these drugs under a prescription by a veterinarian. So having these drugs as a prescription there are no other prescriptions that I'm aware of that can be sold by an unlicensed individual. Um, so our comments were that these individuals don't have appropriate training, they're not licensed in the state, it's not under the pharmacy board, and therefore this raises some serious consumer protection issues, uh, at least for, uh, from our perspective. Uh, I also just want to clarify for you that they, I believe that the status of this regulatory provision is that they pulled some of this language, um, as far as I understand, related to this unlicensed individual being able to sell prescription drugs. I haven't seen the amended language yet. I don't know if, if Val has seen it. No, we haven't seen the amended language yet. But was it your understanding that they uh, pulled some of that language out? Unofficially. Unofficially, okay. So we will keep our eyes out for that. But I do want to also mention that if they do modify the language, we will only have 15 days within which to comment. So it would behoove the board to, uh, again, you know, allow the executive committee that's already established in the board member procedurals manual that I am not on to comment <laughs> on these regulations if we get this modified text that we need to respond to. So um, the the proposed legislation says that these, these dangerous drugs and antibiotics need to be prescribed by a licensed veterinarian or a food directive or oh a veterinary feed directive, feed directive. Uh -huh. and that these products can only be sold by a person who holds the veterinary food and animal drug retail license. But the issue is that this license needs further uh, clarification as far as um, uh, oh, drug distribution, quality control, safe storage and handling. That license is not, is not clearly defined. No, is that the issue? No, the veterinary, uh, food, the veterinary food drug retailer, license. beef adders, they are licensed under the Board of Pharmacy. They're not the issue. It's this new classification that's within the regulation, which is the restricted livestock uh, drug person or licensee 
who is a person that has obtained a license for the purposes of filling these prescriptions. They're they are not regulated. Application. Right. There's no training that we're so, aware of. Um, and they're not uh, licensed under the Board of Pharmacy. I thought they've been licensed. I thought they have been in existence. They have been existing. They have been in existence. You're absolutely right. But they were not able to sell prescription drugs right. because these drugs weren't by way of prescription. Correct. Right. I also have a question. If, if they change it substantially, we have 45 days, don't we? Well, the difference between a 15 day modification and a 45 day re notice is at 40, if they're changing the entire concept of the regulation or pulling back the intent of the regulation, they would have to start over again. But they can make quite a few modifications to this language under a 15-day notice. It just has to be substantially related to the intent and the text that of the initial language. So I, you know, I can foresee a lot of purview for them to do this under a 15-day comment period. You will know where I am every 15 days. Mm -hmm. No going to Africa. Um, I am on the task force, by the way. Our next meeting is on the 27th of November. So. Oh, okay, so that's good to know. Yeah. So we'll get an update on this language. Probably after that. Yeah. And was this aspect of it discussed heavily? Um, not heavily, not yet. I think that our last meeting was actually quite a while ago. So okay. I think that this is coming in, you know, a lot of the details are coming in now. Uh, also, just as a matter of FYI, I included at the end of all the regulatory documents, I included some information from the CDFA's website on the antimicrobial use stewardship page. And I just wanted you to be aware of some of the definitions that are out there today that, that, that CDFA um, through their OS program, their antimicrobial use stewardship program, does float this information uh, to the board through me and request review before these things get posted. For the most part, there are some technical things in here that they would not um, have necessarily provided to me in advance. But one of the areas that continues to come up as a um, struggle in terms of uh, those that we're pushing for some sort of oversight of the use of antimicrobial drugs, and it really starts at the bottom of the first page on antimicrobial use, is the regular pattern of use um, for medically important antimicrobial drugs. And there's uh, some disagreement from some of those who uh, perhaps were in opposition to veterinarians being able to make decisions on when uh, to use these drugs prophylactically. Um, in certain situations, you know, the prophylactic use of antibiotics uh, is still medically indicated, at least from the veterinary profession. Um, there's some disagreement regarding prophylactic use and regular pattern of use. And so we're going to continue to struggle with that, uh, and the profession is going to continue to struggle with that. Uh, one area that's come up quite a bit in meetings that Val and I have been in is when you're transporting cattle intrastate, interstate, and there is uh, some protocol to uh, perhaps treat the cattle before transport to uh, try to prevent the spread of, of infection. And, you know, there's some European models that they don't use antibiotics, and so there's some disagreement on whether or not that's regular pattern of use or whether that's medically indicated. And I think we're going to continue to struggle with that a little bit before we find some common ground. So uh, does this board need to take any action concerning the letter that we wrote? No. OK. No, because you as an executive committee can engage in the rulemaking process in that way. OK. I guess from the extent that you will also need to be available to provide comment during the 15-day comment period, um, the board could, you know, by motion, um, approve the executive committee to continue to function in this capacity, but 
I don't think you need to because you're already established to do that. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Well, since this is just an update, there's no motions here. Uh, so let's move on to agenda item number 10, the legislative report. Um, and and Marie's going to talk about SB 547. Okay, so you all know what's in this bill. This is basically um, a bill that provides some cleanup language for us on uh, modifications of penalty. It also uh, provided the board uh, cleanup provisions related to address of record, which means that uh, a licensee can have both a public forward-facing address and a private address on file with the board uh, for purposes that we may need to keep someone's address uh, non-public. Um, and this allows us to have both a public-facing address and a private address. So those were our provisions in SB 547. And I didn't get a chance to look, admittedly, as to whether or not the governor has signed 547 yet. Is anyone no. aware if it's actually been signed? Okay, Kathy can look. Um, moving on, and then we can go back. It was signed. Okay, oh, thanks, Bob. Signed. Uh, so that one has been signed. And the next two have been signed. The next two have been signed. SB 673, that, and it's okay if we cheer, that the Pet Lover Specialized License Plate Program has now been moved under the California Department of Food and Ag. That was signed. No one cheered. Wait, is it signed? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And AB uh, 485, which was essentially a track bill that was signed by the governor. Um, I can go back and review any of these that you'd like me to, but it wasn't one of our initiatives. Um, AB 942, uh, veterinary uh, personal income tax, that one didn't move forward and it actually was suspended at our last meeting. So nothing more came of that bill. And then finally, we have a bill that you haven't seen before, and I don't know if the governor signed AB 208. He did. He did, oh my. Okay, so the governor signed AB 208. This is deferred entry of judgment, pretrial diversion. Um, as a consumer protection board, I'm a little disheartened by this because essentially there's no conviction on record um, by which the board can take any action if the individual goes into one of these pretrial diversion programs. And my concern oh, go ahead. Sorry. has been allayed because of amendments <clears throat> made to the bill, I think maybe in September. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal of the bill was to address individuals who were going through the diversion program but had to, in effect, plead guilty or um, nolo contendere, and that guilty plea was being used against them for immigration purposes. Mm -hmm. So to modify the wording, allow the deferred entry of judgment, um, this bill changes deferred entry of judgment to a pretrial <coughs> diversion program where the um, individual pleads not guilty, goes through the diversion program, and then it's wiped clean, their record is. However, with the recent um, revisions to the bill that were post September 8th, Or were those the revisions on September? I've got the history here. I don't know if it really matters. Oh, you know what? I think, yeah, the last amendment was September 8th. And that's the, that's the version we have in our packet. So if those of you who are following along, it's under a tab E. Well, in any event, the language now actually refers back to Business and Professions Code Section 492 um, and makes explicit that the, con the record of the allegation can still be used by the professional licensing board. Yep. 
um, for denying a license or taking other disciplinary action against the licensee. It's interesting because that language doesn't currently exist under the law. It's specifically Penal Code Section 1000. Um, those PC 1000 um, convictions have largely been viewed as wiping the slate clean. BPC 492, however, does, it says <coughs> that there aren't any penal code sections that can keep the records away from a professional licensing board, healing mm -hmm. arts board. Mm -hmm. This bill now actually cross-references 492, so it's very clear to not only the, the boards, the healing arts boards, which includes veterinary medicine, but also the individuals who are licensed, that even though you're going through the pretrial diversion program under Penal Code Section 1000, the board can use the arrest, actually. Yeah, the record, yeah. as well as the, the program itself yep. to discipline. Yeah, I just, uh, under section 1000.4, it's page five of six of the bill, a record pertaining to any res arrest resulting in the successful completion of a pretrial diversion program. And it goes on to say that it basically shall not um, be used in any, in successful terms, it shall not be used in any way that could result in the denial of any employment benefit license or certificate except that as specified in 492, successful completion of a pretrial diversion program shall not prohibit any agency established under Division II, which we are, of the code or any initiative act referred to in that division from taking disciplinary action against a licensee or from denying a license for professional misconduct. Anyway, so there is a, there is a new catch-all. Yeah, so the, the recent amendments actually Help, help the board with its disciplinary action so it arguably can't consider these PC-1000 um, arrests. Okay, if I have a client who is applying for a license, does that person have to disclose this? Because I know the, the blowback I'm going to get is that because of this, that they don't have to disclose that. And we run into all this all the time with a client who has um, a conviction expunged and then their criminal attorney tells them, you don't have to tell anybody it's expunged. They don't call me, of course, until you deny the license. And then I tell them expungement doesn't count and the thing at that point is you're telling them that they won't get a license because they're, you know, they acted fraudulently in lying to you and also because they had two DUIs. So that's really my question here is that, um, and Tara, you explained that, great, what's happened here, but do these people applying for a license then have to disclose that because I know that the criminal attorneys are gonna tell them that they don't. The, the wording in PC 1000.4 says you don't have to, right. but yeah. now, as, you know, now that it's really clear that the licensing board can use the record. Yes. But the use of the record is different from the disclosure. So I mean, I'm, right. I'm just suggesting that perhaps the board might have to be lenient or understand that if there is a person who applies for a license and, and answers no to that question, and then you subsequently, because of your background check, find out that they were involved in this PC-1000, that you know, rather than immediately denying a license because of fraudulent activity, you're gonna have to maybe be a little understanding of the fact that if they read the wording and their criminal attorney reads the wording in that PC-1000, they're gonna be told they don't have to disclose it. I read C under 1000.4 to say the defendant shall be advised that regardless of his or her successful completion of pretrial diversion program, the arrest upon which the pretrial diversion was based <coughs> may be disclosed by the Department of Justice in response to any peace officer application request and that notwithstanding subdivision A, this section does not relieve him or her 
of the obligation to disclose the arrest in response to any direct question contained in any questionnaire or application for a position as a peace officer. Oh, just a peace officer. officer. No, she, no. Damn, no, I thought I was on a subject. No, I mean, see, I, I read that. So, I don't know that there's any answer, but I just wanted to call that to your attention. I think that's a valid point because, you know, we are seeing disciplinary um, filings where they're arguing both, that failure to disclose and the conviction or the um, diversion program. Right. So, yeah, I think it is really important when, you know, reviewing applications to, to note whether or not it's the PC-1000. The 1203.4 does require disclosure. Right but the 1,000 doesn't. So, you know, keeping in mind that the applicants are, are just trying to do what people are telling them right. to do. They're trying to You can still deny the license, but it's just, you know, then we can argue, then we can just argue the underlying facts of the criminal case. But, but it, you're often denying the license on two grounds because they were fraudulent when they filled out the application and because of the underlying criminal activity, so I would just, urge you to be understanding of that fact. I mean, we still have to deal with the denial of the license because of the underlying activity. So in, in the past when there was a change to the penal code section in the 1203.4, the legal office did um, issue some directive to their boards and bureaus regarding um, how we need to treat these specific, whether they be uh, Expun whether they're withdrawn, dismissed, expunged, or a pretrial diversion. So I would anticipate something coming up from the legal office um, explaining how the clients are supposed to handle this. Do you have any comments, Mr. Heffler? I will take that back uh, to the legal office and uh, report back to you in the future on what uh, we need to seek legislation to amend that. If these, these officers are have a special exclusion. Should the Healing Arts Board have a special exclusion? I mean, if you're asking my opinion, I think they should have to disclose it. How are we supposed to make a decision regarding whether or not this person poses a threat to the public if there's a certain amount of information that is, you know, kept confidential and we don't, we're not privy to that information, yet we're responsible for making a public safety decision regarding a fitness to practice. So I don't know that I, I can advise you today because I don't know enough about the impact of this 1000.4 on how we're making, making decisions to license an individual. Um, there are very few things that I'm aware of other than something that occurred uh, prior to under a juvenile court prior to someone being an adult that is protected from disclosure when you're seeking a license to practice in the state of California. This would be an exception to the general rule, which is if you are convicted, you have to disclose it. So I think we need to wait for further guidance from the legal office before we make a decision on how to proceed if we need a legislative fix or we need to do something else, but I think if there is information that's kept confidential from a regulatory agency that is not in line with our mandate for consumer protection. So that completes my report. Uh, agenda item number 11. Um, question about oh, sorry. Oh, question. Oh. Can you come forward, please? So I realize this is not on your agenda or something that you can comment on, but I asked Anne Marie and Tara yesterday if I could bring this up, and they said this was the appropriate time. So, as you're all aware, last um, couple of weeks there have been these tremendous fires, and the CVMA is, is very heavily involved in those with our California Veterinary Medical Reserve Corps. Um, last Tuesday or Wednesday, 
um, we had a call. Dr. Miller is our point person for our CAMRC, and we've had a lot of veterinary personnel deployed over in Santa Rosa. Um, he got a call from one of the uh, large emergency clinics, one of the very few hospitals that was able to stay open. Um, some burnt to the ground, and most of them, a good portion of them, didn't have electricity, weren't able to open, or veterinarian <coughs> lost their home, or whatever the situation was. This particular um, hospital was taking in animals that were injured, and they were also receiving animals, um, actual um, owners coming in with their animals that were on regular medications. These owners um, didn't no longer had a home. They no longer had access to those medications, so it was a really dire situation. So they were asking uh, Dr. Miller, could, we, could they waive the VCPR? under the circumstances because if they didn't have time to treat animals and then conduct a physical exam and go through the entire paperwork and so forth. So um, just the day before, uh, I saw that the pharmacy board um, posted, sent an email out to all pharmacists and they have a regulation that says um, under a state of emergency, um, requirements for furnishing prescription drugs, providing emergency refills without authorization, and operating a mobile pharmacy um, are, I'm not gonna say waived, but there's reasonable um, requirements that are waived under disaster situations, and they go on to list how a pharmacist is supposed to handle um, those types of requests mm -hmm. during a declared emergency. So I reached out to Anne Marie and she and Tara were just great and immediately got on it saying there must be something that we can do. And unfortunately there is really nothing that mimics what the pharmacy law does. However, um, Anne Marie was and, and Tara were willing to provide us with a couple well-written sentences <laughs> of how this could be considered an emergency situation and a veterinarian could basically use their discretion and make sure you tell them to document um, that this was an emergency situation. So we relayed this to our, our member over at this practice and they were quite grateful. However, it really pointed out um, something that I think the board really needs to take under consideration. Obviously, we cannot anticipate, you know, the phenomenal disaster that this was, and this may not occur again for a long time, and it could occur next week. So I just wanted to bring the situation forward to you because um, hopefully as you're looking at your legislation for next year, this is something you could look at because I think we can all agree that um, it's, it's badly needed. We just never knew it <laughs> until this particular disaster. So thank you. Thank you. So speaking of that, agenda nine, um, number 11, discussion of possible board action on 2018 legislative proposals. Um, so we'll try to get through as much of this as we can yes. before we have to end our day. Uh, these, most of these you have seen before in some fashion. So if you go, I can't really follow the agenda because for some reason I lost my mind and I did them out of order in my document. So if you go to item 11, um, go to item 11, there is a document that outlines uh, each of these requests for legislation. Don't get too hung up on the language because as these things go through the legislative process, the Ledge Council actually writes the language. But let's just talk about concepts and we can take them one by one. Veterinary Assistant Controlled Substances Permit, probationary license. What I'm requesting that the board do is, is provide me with uh, an affirmative action, provide me with <laughs> the ability to seek legislation that would authorize us as staff to uh, issue a probationary license to a veterinary assistant who holds a, or who is um, applying for a controlled substance permit, similar to what we already do with RBTs. Um, just by way of background, for every 12 cases I'm looking at that uh, have some sort of uh, criminal history or disciplinary history, 
I would say greater than 85% of those files are veterinary assistant controlled substance permit applications. So they are taking up a great deal of time. Because there's no authority in law for uh, our enforcement staff to offer a probationary license like we do with an RBT, my only option is to deny. And these individuals then would have to go through the hearing process, um, would have to appear before an ALJ, the decision would be rendered as a proposed decision, and we all know how long and expensive that process is. This would save both the applicant some time, money, and grief, and would also be less expensive to the board if we are able to offer the probationary law license where appropriate, similar to what we do with the RVT. The board still has to approve those stipulated settlements for the probationary license. It would just prevent me from having to do an outright denial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this, would this uh, envision this going like through an omnibus bill? Yeah. And, and I think at previous meetings, Candace had, to, had uh, Give us examples of how much time and how much money provisionary licenses were for RBTs. Right. And it's not just you trying to amass more money. <laughs> no. Executive dollars. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if that, that statement might have been lost on the audience. No. <laughs> it's not. They're all tired. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Do you need comments from the board? We do need a motion on each of these. Yes. And no. she's just looking for direction, looking for yeah. the concepts. I think it's very, so, very reasonable. Motion to accept. Okay. Kathy, you second it? I think, yeah, you said motion to approve this in concept. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? I like chronic inebriety. Chronic inebriety. I, I presume that the the, um, the the issue is that you're finding something when you, uh, after they go through the fingerprinting, something turns up and therefore you can't issue them a clear uh, BACSP. How many of the ones that you've gone through the process end up being rejected after the process? So we don't have actual stats, but I can tell you there are quite a few that I have to deny. So I don't have a statistic for every 100 I'm denying 12. Um, are they in your stats, Ethan, for tomorrow? No. We can get those statistics. I can tell you that the number of applications I see for any applicant who has a criminal history or a disciplinary history, I typically would see perhaps, uh, i trying to give you a ballpark figure, let's just say I review 30 files a month that for the various uh, uh, license types. 85%, and I've done my own statistics on how many of those that I'm denying are veterinary assistant controlled substance permit people versus RBTs or veterinarians. So it's substantially more that I'm getting criminal histories on for the VACSP category versus the RBT or the veterinarian. And then of those, how many end up being ultimately, uh, you, you ultimately reject them if they have a conviction for controlled substances? But if, if, they, they, have if a, they have a conviction for driving without a license or something like that, then? It depends on the factors. Did they complete their criminal probation? How long ago was the DUI? Is there multiple DUIs? So I can't answer that point blank because every case is individual. There are facts in every case that I have to weigh. Are there fines outstanding? You know, again, if they didn't complete all of their criminal probation, I would probably deny the license at that point because they never satisfied their criminal probation. So it just depends on the factors of each individual mm -hmm. case. If they have a felony conviction for a, a drug possession Thank or you. they don't qualify to have the ACSP, that's not a denial, that's a disqualification. So the denials are just for misdemeanor, the gray, the gray misdemeanors, uh, it could be DUIs, it could be assault, it could be, I mean, there's a myriad of things that it could be that aren't felony drug convictions. Felony drug convictions do not result in a denial. They are not qualified to be a veterinary assistant con controlled substance permit holder if they have a felony drug conviction. So on what basis are you rejecting them if they have these other things? I, I think I explained that. It depends on the length of time that they're, if it's sobriety, at, was it 10 or 20 years ago, were there multiple convictions 
Did they complete their criminal probation? So I go through a, a series of. Um, I, I guess my point, my real question is: so, what are the grounds for uh, rejecting a person for a BACSP? But it's under. 480. I mean, I think it's, it's in here. So is it the same as for? Yes. Uh, it's like a, a crime relative yes. related to the practice of veterinary medicine? Yeah, or conviction of a misdemeanor or felony. Yeah. Any other comments from the public? So we have a motion, a second. Any other comments from the board, I guess, first? Oh, sure. The motion to pursue the, yeah. Yeah. the motion is to pursue a legislative uh, change that would allow for the board to offer a probationary license to an applicant for a veterinary assistant controlled substance permit that may otherwise be denied outright. And that uh, ability to issue a probationary license would be similar to the decision to do so for an RVT based on criminal history. And, I'm sorry. Have you seen that long before? I must yeah. <laughs> well, I think I explained it not as a motion, but as yeah, a concept. Well, and there was a second. A second. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah. Second. Call for the vote. Okay. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Kathy Bowler. Yes. Jennifer Laredo. Yes. Dr. Nolan. Yes. Dr. Nunez. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. And once again. Do I get to read this or do we do it after the whole thing? Oh, no, that's just regs. So this is for statutes, so we don't have to read it. Oh, Kathy, you missed out. Darn it. Darn it. No, we don't have to read it. Okay. What's next? Moving on, let's just go in order of the document. So page three, uh, veterinary student exemption. This is still a Well. It was an MDC, but this was also a proposal from the last legislative cycle. So since we need to be able to go to the Business Professions and Economic Development Committee or another omnibus committee to ask for legislation to be carried, it's timely for us to consider this. Even though it's not ready. So well, it may be ready. So we have, we have language that the MDC actually proposed and this doesn't prevent anybody from weighing in on this language because it's going to go through the entire legislative process and if there are comments, they will be heard. Um, but there is language at the MDC, work bless you, worked through yesterday. Um, I think Tara has a couple of changes to that language, but for the purposes of moving this along, Tara, do you want to review the language? As long as everyone has it in front of them. It's uh, item six of the hand carry MDC report, technically page three. So the revisions that came out of the committee yesterday are in front of you. Uh, what I would like to point out is that um, there are a couple things that could be viewed as substantive, so I just want to present this to you for your consideration quickly. Um, in uh, 5A1, the clinical training site, that uh, phrase just came out of yesterday's deliberation. What was previously uh, in the bill was off-campus or distributive site. Um, I think that um, perhaps for your consideration, maybe you want to use off-campus or distributive site instead of clinical training site. It's a bit more descriptive. Also, in uh, two, the student should be has prior training. In, and these activities, it's like you're referring back to several items that are up under five, so it's, it's a bit confusing for the student. Uh, I think these activities could be changed to diagnosis, treatment, and surgery, for clarity's sake. Also, uh, on three, the supervision uh, must be, I, th I think that should be clarified as the supervision of the student is provided. 
by a California licensed veterinarian. Um, also, the beginning of this starts with students of an American Veterinary Medical Association Council on Education Accredited Veterinary Medical Program may participate. This is a description of who is exempt from licensure requirements. Mm -hmm. So I think may should, needs to change to who. May participate is really who <coughs> participates. So you're saying students who participate? Yeah. Because it's, it's about exempting the students in this situation. Who participates? Okay. Um, Tara, can I see your document? Because I think for the purposes of the public, we should probably review it in totality. Um, so the proposal would be, and again, we don't need to wordsmith it too much because the legislature is going to do uh, their part. Students of an American Veterinary Medical Association Council on Education accredited veterinary medical program who participate at, as part of their formal curriculum in diagnosis and treatment with direct supervision or in surgery with immediate supervision provided the following requirements are met. A, the off-campus or distributed site has been approved by the university where the student is enrolled. B, the student has prior training in diagnosis, treatment, and surgery as part of the formal curriculum. And C, the supervisor of the student must be a California, or it, the supervision of the student is provided by, excuse me, a California licensed veterinarian in good standing as defined in, and so on. Does that capture everything there? Yes. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense, though, because you say you, you, you may participate. It originally said you may participate provided the following are required, requirements are met. And then you say uh, who participate it should be provided who. the following requirements are met. It should be who. Who participate. So we're, we're providing a description of a student who's exempt from licensure for diagnosis, treatment, and surgery. If the yeah, following three, three yeah. items have been met. So, I mean, it said these students who participate provided the following requirements are met. Yes. That doesn't make sense. It seems to, it seems to imply they can't do it on campus. I mean, it's like who participate can do so provided the following requirements are met. I think we're getting stuck on wordsmithing and it's not going to be up to us mm -hmm. in the long run. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. line, isn't it? so Dr. Thank Sullivan you. originally made a motion, very quick motion after this was read. Well, I, I, my motion was to move this concept forward. Legislation. Okay, we have a second. Any comments from the public? Yes, Dr. Klingberg. So my interpretation of 5A, first of all, is that the original 5A and 5B, 5A was students within the university setting who were getting their education, and 5B was those in off-campus and distributive sites. And when we struck 5B, we changed the language in 5A to be inclusive of both on-campus right. and off-campus sites. Right. So I felt that the language yesterday, I wasn't going to wordsmith with the group, but I felt that the language in 1, or I, as you want to call it, clinical training site actually should have said veterinary medical program to maintain consistency. The veterinary medical program has been approved by the university where the student is enrolled. That is both on campus, off campus, and distributive. That's an inclusive statement. It is part of the formal curriculum. Um, the other thing that I had thought since we're here talking about it is that the beginning of this entire section should be as part of their formal curriculum, comma, students of an AVMA COE school may participate uh, in diagnosis and treatment with direct supervision or in surgery with immediate supervision. And I just felt that that flowed better than all of the uh, phrases that we have in there. 
But the intent of 5A as it's been rewritten is to include all forms of education and the exemption in 4830 is for education in all sites, not just off campus or distributive. We're allowing them to practice veterinary medicine without a license. I, I like your, I like the arrangement of the introduction. I, I do think though saying that the veterinary med medical, veterinary medical programs has been approved, that means something else. So we're actually talking about the site where the student is being placed, whether it's a distributive model or whether it's somewhere on campus. If you're saying the programs approved by the university, you're talking about the entire veterinary medical program, which means something else. And we're talking about the site where the student is actually going to be providing services to the public's animals. Okay. So I don't, I don't think program would be the right description. I do agree that when we were talking about this clinical training, it could be on campus or off campus. And I think somehow we need to capture that. Because the VMTH is on campus, but these students are providing services to the public's animals. And what we want to make sure of is if they're doing that, and this is part of their formal curriculum, that these requirements have been met. So whatever words we can come up with that says the X, and I don't know, externship has a meaning that externship may not be the right terminology, um, but we can definitely work with the universities to bring <coughs> that terminology to encompass both off-site and on-site experience. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Yeah. I did. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Which yeah. language are we? So we'll just, just the, the concept of this. The concept, the concept of the language yeah. that we just discussed. We just with, yeah. with oh, the Got it. Shall we go? No more public comment? I asked. Are you asked? Okay. All right. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Kathy Bowler? Yes. Jennifer Laredo? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. And Dr. Nunez? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And here we are working. So, moving on. Uh, page four. Okay. Page four, the veterinary student, or the veterinary graduate, RBT duties, this is the exact language that the board approved at the April 2017 meeting. This essentially gives the uh, board a prospective, basically gives due notice to those that are graduates of a recognized veterinary college that are performing duties as an RBT but never got a license as an RBT, that the window of opportunity is gonna close. That's the best way to say this. Tara, I would ask that we probably need to move this date out to 2020 to give them advance notice. I agree. Okay. So this would say that by 2020, if a graduate graduate of recognized veterinary college is performing animal health care tasks um, otherwise performed by an RBT, the graduate the graduate has to discontinue providing such duties unless they get licensed. That's the gist of it. And the board has previously approved this concept, so I'm just asking you to say, go for it, make it up. So if it was already approved, why are we approving it again? Well, because I'm changing the date to 2020. Well, what we have to talk about. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about it. <laughs> I'm, ch I'm changing the due notice. <laughs> Any comments? I know. I mean, this. Uh, I mean, the, the answer is that this is actually we approved it, but yeah. now we have to put it into a. a, a yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we're doing. With your vehicle, that's what it is. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Then let's put the concept we already approved on into a vehicle. Well, <laughs> with a 2020 <laughs> effective date. I guess I'm just second that. Appears to be a motion. Yes. Was that a motion? It's, it's close okay. to a motion. Close. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Close, close to a motion. motion. Is there any com comments from the public? 
I would just like to suggest that you also uh, recommend to the MDC that they look into creating a new eligibility category for the RBT exam, that a person who is a graduate of a recognized veterinary college be able to sit for the California RBT exam. Yeah. No, they can't do that now? They can't do that? There's no specific uh, category. They could use the uh, alternate route, but that would require two and a half years working under a California veterinarian. Uh, yes, right. I believe that when we created 2027.5 under the MDC, which would not be able to go into effect until this did, we provided for an avenue for these graduates to take the RBT exam. So that was already discussed and approved by the MDC. We just can't move forward with implementing that into regulation until we do this by statute. And that was the new 2027.5. Okay. Is that everybody else's recollection? I like something, I don't remember. I don't remember that we approved them taking the RBT exam. Ethan. Remember the work we did? I think it's in, it's in well, 2027. if it hasn't already been done, it should yeah. be done. I'll look into it, but I believe 2027.5, the new 2027.5 accomplishes that. Any other comments from the public? <laughs> Any comments from the Lion Watcher? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> Any more comments from the board? I think we've all seen something shiny, so I'm going to call for the vote. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Kathy Bowler? Yes. Jennifer Laredo? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. And Dr. Nunez? Yes. Okay, I think everyone's going to be thrilled when I say we can disregard the next one. Which are we going to be able to you want to know why we're going to disregard no, no, no. I do. Yeah. Does someone want to know? Yeah. Tell us. Okay. So the OPES came before the board at its April meeting and said the yes. ELE for the veterinary law exam for veterinarians yes. was adequately covered under the California State Board exam, yes. and therefore applicants who already take the VLE should not need to take or excuse me, that already take the California State Board exam shouldn't have to take the VLE. Yes, they, they don't typically take both exams anyway. The problem is what they wanted us to do, the board said we don't want to do away with the VLE because there are several licensing categories that don't take the CSB. Reciprocity doesn't take the California State Board exam. Uh, university license wouldn't take the state board exam. So the board was not in favor of removing the VLE. <clears throat> because of that, the OPES said, well, technically, this is not an exam. It's an open book resource tool. So we should change the name of it. Changing the name of it doesn't provide any benefit to any of us. In that, we still have to, if we're going to administer it as a prerequisite to licensure, we still have to validate it. We still have to go through and do workshops. We still have to have exam security. So I would suggest that we disregard changing legislation that is not going to have any administrative or financial benefit to the board. But we can do it if you so choose. So does that mean everything stays as it is right now? <coughs> and I think Dr. Nolan brought up brought up that we'd also be losing money from an already very tight budget. Any other comment on that? Any comments from the public on that point? Okay, can we move on to the last one in this section? I think that was the last one. Oh, no, 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 the hospitals. Okay. So the very last um, proposal is again something that was in SB 546, and I'm just asking for you to say move forward and put it back in a vehicle. It was removed for fiscal reasons. Um, the uh, Appropriations Committee was concerned about how expensive it would be for the board to meet our 20 percent. Yeah, yeah. So they're concerned about that. So what we'd like to be able to uh, engage in a dialogue that says, if you make us do that, if you build it, they will come. So if you make us do this and it's a mandate, the Department of Finance can fund it through the licensing fees. 
So I'm just asking for the board to approve this as another uh, legislative initiative. Dr. Sullivan. Yeah, I, I think that's a legitimate concern because we do go through economic cycles and when we have the next downturn and the governor decides to take some of our money or whatever mechanism they use, now we've got a mandate to do 20% and we may not have the money to do it. So how do you, how, how does a, a, an agency handle that situation or a board? The same way we do when we have a mandate to enforce the laws and to take disciplinary action and we run out of money and we have to stop doing it and we have to explain that we had to stop doing it because we ran out of money. So that's, it, it happens in all program areas. And there's been times in the past where we've actually had to discontinue enforcement because there was no money left. So this is no different than any other uh, program within the board. And then the staff would, uh, or the board would then prioritize where the cuts are. Yeah. Where the program, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think from a public perspective, it's certainly uh, with consumer protection in mind that a 20% inspection is minimum of what we should be able to do and that we should be funded for it. So, I mean, for public protection, I think we have to. So, I think it's good to clarify it. Thank you. I think this is the, hospital inspection is like the most effective tool that we have in trying to advance veterinary yeah. medicine. Well, so we're not we're trying to advance it though, as the board. Okay. Whatever term you want to use there. <laughs> it's our most effective tool for outreach. For outreach. <laughs> Any other comments? So do we have a motion? What's the motion to oh. approve, approve that. that. Second. Moving we'll forward. We have a motion, second. Is there any comment from the public? Any other comment from the board? Call for the vote. Okay. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Jennifer Laredo. Yes. Kathy Bowler. Yes. Dr. <coughs> Nunez. Yes. Dr. Nolan. Yes. Yes. Motion passes. To agenda item number 12, public comment for items not on the agenda. Anne Marie, you were right about the 127.5. We did in January of this year. We did pass that uh, to allow uh, students with any months of graduation to sit in their teams. Okay. Yes, right. So I was wrong about the law enforcement officer, but I reviewed it myself. So it's been a good day. It's a blush. So hearing no items for future agendas, we will recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.